<clears throat> id software famous for quake doom wolfenstein and rescue rover that's right folks over the next little while we're going to be talking about the lost games of id software my name is dave and this is Ludi Antiqui. To really understand where these games come from, we need to start off with a little history. Once upon a time, there was a publishing company called Softdisk, based in Shreveport, Louisiana. Softdisk was a publisher of disc magazines, or magazettes as they like to call them, for various home computer systems including the Apple II, the Commodore 64, and the IBM PC. By 1990, Softdisk's IBM PC magazette Big Blue Disc was proving to be especially popular. In an attempt to capitalize on this growing PC market, Softdisk launched a new magazette called Gamer's Edge, which focused exclusively on games, most of which were created by their star programmers, John Romero and John Carmack, with the unofficial aid of another Softdisk employee, Tom Hall, who would come in after hours to help them out. John Carmack was a tinkerer at heart. Although he was new to IBM PC programming, he wasn't content to follow the status quo. Armed with a copy of Michael Abrash's new book, Power Graphics Programming, Carmack confronted with gusto the challenge of doing something that had never before been seen in an IBM PC game. Gameplay with a smooth scrolling background, similar to what Nintendo had accomplished on the Famicom. He started by tackling smooth vertical scrolling, which in the end resulted in the creation of a simple shoot-em-up game. That completed, he moved on to getting smooth horizontal scrolling working as well. Late one September night, Carmack achieved the goal he'd been seeking, smooth horizontal and vertical scrolling by exploiting various EGA hardware features. John Romero had already gone home for the night, but Tom Hall was still hanging around the office. Upon seeing the smooth scrolling engine, Hall declared that he and Carmack should play a prank on Romero. Using a well-loved copy of Super Mario Bros. 3 that they had in the office, Carmack and Hall recreated the tiles and layout from the first level of that game replaced the Mario sprite with Dangerous Dave, one of Romero's creations, and placed it all on a floppy disk with a label that said, Run Me. Leaving the disk on Romero's desk, John Carmack and Tom Hall went home to get some sleep. A few hours later, John Romero came into work. Curious at what it could be, he booted up the disk, was greeted by a friendly title screen calling the game Dangerous Dave and Copyright Infringement, and was immediately enthralled, spending some three hours exploring it over and over and over again. Romero realized how groundbreaking this new game engine was, but most of the other employees at Softdisk seemed much less impressed with this new technology. What's more, Softdisk management was not interested in using the engine in their new games, because it wasn't compatible with CGA video cards, which were still fairly common at the time. Not once to be discouraged, Carmack, Romero, and Hall decided to double down on the engine's potential and made a fully functional Super Mario Bros. 3 demo which, through a sympathetic project manager at Softdisk named Jay Wilbur, they were able to eventually get to Nintendo. While Nintendo was purportedly impressed with the demo, they weren't interested in expanding into the PC market and turned the game down. All, however, was not lost. For months, John Romero had been receiving enthusiastic letters from a multitude of fans requesting that he write back to them. He soon realized, though, that all of this fan mail shared the same return address. Furious at the deception, Romero wrote and sent an angry letter to the specified address, though in the end he decided to preface it with a somewhat more even-keeled cover letter. What he received in return was completely unexpected. A publishing offer. Scott Miller, founder of Apogee Software and creator of the popular Cross series of computer games, had for months been trying to surreptitiously contact John Romero in an effort to poach his talent and bring him into the shareware industry. Miller had been very impressed with Romero's Pyramids of Egypt and was looking for something that would solidify Apogee's place in the gaming industry. While he found Romero's initial offering somewhat interesting, the moment he saw the Super Mario Bros. 3 demo, Miller knew that he had found something special. Miller gave Carmack, Romero, and Hall a $2,000 advance, along with a $100 weekly pizza bonus, to develop a game trilogy for Apogee by Christmas, some two months away. Carmack, Romero, and Hall immediately set off to work on their new game. There were only two problems faced by this group that would soon be calling themselves id Software. They still needed to make games for the Gamer's Edge magazine, and they didn't have the resources at home to create a cutting-edge game for Apogee. The solution to these two problems could very well have been the motto of id Software in its early years. Work hard, and break a few rules. Every morning before anyone else had shown up, they would arrive at the office and spend the day working on games for Gamer's Edge. Every evening, once everyone else had gone home, they would use the company computers to work on their own game trilogy. Most Fridays after work, they would back their trucks up to the office door, borrow the soft disk computers, and spend the weekend working on the trilogy in the rental home, a nearby lake house. After three months of hard work, the game trilogy was finally complete. On December 14th, 1990, id Software unleashed their first creation upon the world, Commander Keen, an invasion of the Vorticons. A month later, a new pizza money check arrived. This time, however, that check was for $10,000. Dollars. 
Scott Miller's hunch had paid off. Thanks to Commander Keen, Apogee's monthly profits had more than quadrupled, and he immediately commissioned id Software to begin working on a sequel trilogy. It had come to the point where the boys could no longer live a double life. It was time to move on from Softdisk. John Romero invited Al Vicovius, the head of Softdisk and one of its founders, out to lunch. During that lunch, Romero informed him that the Gamer's Edge crew was going to leave to start up their own game company. Not wanting to lose his star team, Vakovius offered that they instead form a game studio with him, where he would take care of the business side of things and they could just focus on making games. The Gamer's Edge team loved this idea, but when Vakovius informed the other Softdisk department heads of the plan, they were so upset by this apparent favoritism that they threatened to all quit if the deal went through. Unable to work together directly, a new deal was made. In order to smooth the transition period as a new in-house Softdisk team got up to speed with the technology that Carmack and Romero had developed, id Software would provide a regular supply of games for the Gamer's Edge Megazette's first year. It's these titles that we're going to be talking about over the next series of videos, the so-called Lost Games of id Software. Thanks for watching this video about the creation of Gamer's Edge and the founding of id Software. Check out my next video, which talks about the first of these Gamer's Edge games, Dangerous Dave. And don't forget to subscribe for more.